On March 23rd, 2017, Eric and I organized a debate between Dr. Michael Brown and Rabbi Daniel Freitag on the topic, Is Jesus the Jewish Messiah? And here's a question that I asked Rabbi Freitag during the Q&A portion of that debate. So my question is, I don't know what your position is on whether Jesus rose from the dead or not, but if he did rise from the dead, why would God raise someone from the dead which would prove their messiahship if he's not the messiah? You really want to know my answer? It never happened. The book was written to convince people of an idea that did not happen. We don't believe in that. Not a word of it. I can tell you. Rabbi Freitag is saying that the Jewish community does not believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And similarly, when Ben Shapiro was on the Joe Rogan podcast, Joe asked Ben if he thought Jesus was resurrected. And this is the way Ben responded. No, that's not, that's not a, a Jewish belief. Okay, I just want to check. Yeah. There's this common idea that Jews don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but this is being challenged by the thousands of Messianic Jews today who proclaim Yeshua as the risen Messiah. Many still say that believing that Jesus rose from the dead is not kosher, it's not Jewish. But I wanna talk about an Orthodox rabbi who challenged such an idea, and that is the late Dr. Pincus Lapid, who in 1978 became the first Jewish New Testament scholar to write a full-length book on Jesus' resurrection. It was later translated into English as The Resurrection of Jesus, A Jewish Perspective. And while many non-Messianic Jewish scholars grant that Jesus' tomb was empty and that his disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus, Lapid went a step further. He concluded his study by claiming that the best explanation of the data from the earliest Jewish sources is that the resurrection of Jesus was an event that occurred in history. And I want to take you through some of his reasons for how he arrived at such a conclusion. Rabbi Lapid points to a primary text found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 5, and this is what it says. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Based on linguistic analysis, Lapid considers this text to be Jewish oral tradition that Paul received from the first witnesses of the risen Jesus. Some of his points include the vocabulary sentence structure and diction are clearly unpauline, the parallelism of the three individual statements is biblically formulated, the threefold and that characterizes the Aramaic and Mishnaic Hebrew way of narration, the divine passive of being raised paraphrases God's action of salvation in order not to mention God in accordance with the Jewish fear of the name. The Aramaic form of the name Cephas, not Simon, as Luke gives it in the parallel passage Luke 24, 34, sounds more original. There are a number of other points that he raises, and according to Rabbi Lapid, this Jewish tradition that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15 may be considered a statement of eyewitnesses for whom the experience of the resurrection became the turning point of their life. Lapid considers the possibility that these experiences were subjective visions. However, in the end, he finds this to be unpersuasive. After citing Talmudic examples of this honest auto-suggestion, he notes that the subjective visions in these Talmudic accounts never transform the life of those having such experiences. And in contrast, the disciples' lives were radically transformed as a result of their encounter with the risen Jesus. This is what he says. When this scared band of apostles, which was just about to throw away everything in order to flee in despair to Galilee, when these peasants, shepherds, and fishermen, who betrayed and denied their master and then failed him miserably, suddenly could be changed overnight into a confident mission society, convinced of salvation and able to work with much more success after Easter than before Easter, then no such vision or hallucination is sufficient to explain such a revolutionary transformation." According to Lapid, there is enough evidence to conclude that Jesus' disciples had experiences they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus, and this cannot be explained by visions or hallucinations. And when it comes to Jesus' empty tomb, Lapid thinks the gospel's recording that women were the first ones to discover that it was empty is highly significant, because in rabbinic literature, women were considered untrustworthy witnesses. For example, Lapid points to the Babylonian Talmud in Rosh Hashanah 22a, which indicates that the only exception for a woman to give testimony in court is to testify that a man had died so that his widow was allowed to remarry. This is the way Lapid puts it. 
In a purely fictional narrative, one would have avoided making women the crowned witnesses of the resurrection, since they were considered, in rabbinic Judaism, as incapable of giving valid testimony. So according to Lapide, the evidence indicates that the disciples had experiences of seeing the risen Jesus, and Jesus' tomb was found empty. One of the objections Lapid addresses comes from a 2nd century polemicist named Celsus and the 18th century deistic philosopher Hermann Samuel Reymaris. They argued that Jesus' resurrection is not believable because he did not appear publicly. But from Lapid's Jewish perspective, this is not a good objection. This is the way he responds. In the same way all resurrections and resuscitations of which the Bible and rabbinical literature speak happen only in the presence of a few people who are personally concerned, thus the small number of witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus is not an obstacle to the Easter faith, but, on the contrary, it speaks for the authenticity of that salvation experience in Jerusalem almost two millennia ago. Lapid surveys other objections and explanations as well, but in the end he finds them to be unpersuasive, and he concludes his study by explaining how this evidence for Jesus' resurrection changed his mind. This is what he says. In regard to the future resurrection of the dead, I am and remain a Pharisee. Concerning the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday, I was for decades a Sadducee. I am no longer a Sadducee. I accept the resurrection of Jesus, not as an invention of the community of disciples, but as a historical event. Rabbi Lapid, as an Orthodox Jewish New Testament scholar, affirmed that Jesus rose from the dead. For Lapid, Jesus' resurrection is kosher. Now, he doesn't then say that Jesus is therefore the Messiah, because according to Lapid, the Jewish Messiah is not expected to rise from the dead. But he does say that the spread of faith in Jesus' resurrection, quote, has to be recognized as part of divine providence. He supports his view by citing the great Jewish philosopher Maimonides, who wrote, All these matters which refer to Jesus of Nazareth only serve to make the way free for the King Messiah, and to prepare the whole world for the worship of God with a united heart. From Lapid's perspective, Jesus is not the Messiah, but his resurrection prepared the way for the Messiah to come by bringing Gentiles to worship the God of Israel. Lapid even says, Jesus' resurrection must therefore belong to God's plan of salvation. I think this unique Jewish perspective is one that deserves consideration. Now I want to share with you my own perspective on Jesus' resurrection that also relies on the work of Maimonides, who Lapid considered the greatest religious philosopher of Judaism. Maimonides once said, You should listen to the truth, whoever may have said it. I think he's right. Truth can come out of the mouth of anyone. Anyone is capable of producing truth. Truth can come from those who we radically disagree with. And as a Messianic Jew, there are some things that I agree with Maimonides on, and there's others that I don't. What I disagree with him on is his view that Yeshua falsely claimed to be the Messiah, that he attempted to abolish the Torah, that he was justifiably killed as a false prophet, and he never rose from the dead. And yet, it is this brilliant Jewish thinker who actually gives the best reasons to believe that Yeshua's resurrection would be evidence that he is in fact the Jewish Messiah. Here's what I'm arguing. Given Maimonides exposition of Deuteronomy 13, if Jesus rose from the dead, this event would be God's validation of Jesus' messianic identity and his pronouncement that Jesus taught Israel to remain faithfully committed to Torah observance. Toward this end, it is helpful to read Jesus' resurrection and related biblical data through Maimonides' exposition of Deuteronomy 13. So let's get started. In Deuteronomy 13, verse 2 through 6, this is what it says. If there should stand up in your midst a prophet or a dreamer of a dream, and he will produce to you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes about of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us follow gods of others that you did not know, and we shall worship them. Do not hearken to the words of that prophet or to that dreamer of a dream. For Hashem your God is testing you to know whether you love Hashem your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Hashem your God shall you follow, and him shall you fear. His command shall you observe, and to his voice shall you hearken. Him shall you serve, and to him shall you cleave. And that prophet and that dreamer of a dream shall be put to death, for he had spoken perversion against Hashem your God. You shall destroy the evil from your midst. 
This passage provides the criteria for Israel to distinguish between true and false prophets. If someone claiming to be a prophet produces a sign or a wonder, but they tell Israel to follow gods of others, they are a false prophet, and according to Deuteronomy 13, verse 6, they shall be put to death. So the question is, why would a false prophet produce signs and wonders? What I think is going on here is that the false prophet produces signs and wonders in an attempt to legitimate their prophetic status in the eyes of Israel because this is how God validates true prophets. A key example of this is found in Exodus 14. Moses leads the children of Israel to the Red Sea while the Egyptian army pursues them from behind. And God commands Moses, quote, Lift up your staff and stretch out your arm over the sea and split it. And the children of Israel shall come into the midst of the sea on dry land. And behold, I shall strengthen the heart of Egypt, and they will come after them. And I will be glorified through Pharaoh and through his entire army. Exodus 14, verse 16 through 17. Now Moses obeys God and the Red Sea splits, allowing Israel to travel through it on dry ground. The Egyptians attempt to cross as well, and the water comes down on them, destroying the Egyptian army. And in Exodus 14.31, it says, Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. God validates Moses as a true prophet through these miraculous signs. And I think Deuteronomy 34 verse 10 through 12 summarizes this point well. It says, Never again has there arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom Hashem had known face to face, as evidenced by all the signs and wonders that Hashem sent him to perform in the land of Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his courtiers and all his land, and by all the strong hand and awesome power that Moses performed before the eyes of all Israel. The evidence for Moses' status as a true prophet was all the signs and wonders that Hashem sent him to perform. So then the question is, how can Israel distinguish between true prophets and false prophets if they're both producing miracles? This is where I think Maimonides' exposition of Deuteronomy 13 is essential. In Mishnah Torah, Maimonides wrote, If a prophet bids us worship idols even on a single occasion, we are not to listen to him. And though he performs great signs and wonders, if he says that the Almighty commanded him that an idol should be worshipped this day only or this hour only, since he seeks to discredit the teaching of Moses, we know for certain that he is a false prophet, and whatever he did was done by secret arts and with the aid of witchcraft. According to Maimonides, it is crucial to understand the connection between miracles and the teachings of those claiming to be true prophets. If one claims to be a prophet, but they attempt to discredit the teaching of Moses, then Israel can be assured that their miracle was done by secret arts and with the aid of witchcraft. For Maimonides, the key issue is the source of power of the miracle. Similarly, in his letter to Yemen, Maimonides wrote, We are enjoined to yield obedience to one who asserts that he is a prophet, provided he can substantiate his claims by miracle or proofs. Although there is a possibility that he is an imposter, however, if the would-be prophet teaches tenets that negate the doctrines of Moses, then we must repudiate him. For Maimonides, the Torah's guide to identify a true prophet is to determine whether God is the source of the miracle's power. And this can be done by evaluating their view of Torah. If they, quote, negate the doctrines of Moses, then Israel can know that the source of the power for their miracle came from secret arts and with the aid of witchcraft. However, if the miracle they perform is done through God's power, this indicates that they are a true prophet and Israel should obey them. An example of this Deuteronomy 13 test being put into action is found in 1 Kings 18. This is where Elijah sets up a test to demonstrate that he is a true prophet and the God of Israel is the one true God. On Mount Carmel, Elijah challenges the 450 prophets of Baal to put a bull on an altar of their choice and place wood under it. He says, you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. 1 Kings 18.24 These 450 prophets call upon the name of their God, but there is no response. When it's Elijah's turn, he builds both an altar and a trench. He lays the offering on the wood and has four jars of water poured over the offering three times, and it fills the trench. Elijah then asks God to answer him, demonstrating that, quote, You are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that it is by your word that I have done all these things. 1 Kings 18.36 as a result, fire falls from heaven and consumes not only the offering, but also the wood and the stones and the earth, and it licked up the water in the trench. 
And at the sight of this, all the people fell on their faces and exclaimed, Hashem, he is the God. Hashem, he is the God. 1 Kings 18, 38 to 39. So consistent with Deuteronomy 13, Elijah provides a sign to justify his status as a true prophet and bring Israel back to the worship of the true God. The Talmud provides more insight as to why Elijah asked God twice to answer him. The first answer was the request that fire descend from the heavens, while the second answer was the request that Israel should accept complete faith in God and not say that the fire descending from the heavens was an act of sorcery. Also, Rabbi Obadiah Sofrano, he wrote this concerning Elijah in 1 Kings 18. He said, The heavenly fire descending and consuming Elijah's offering on the rebuilt altar, as well as the water in the surrounding moat, proved that he had acted with God's approval. And both of these explanations are consistent with Maimonides' understanding of Deuteronomy 13. God validates Elijah as a true prophet by providing a miraculous sign, in this case, fire from heaven. Further rabbinic support for Maimonides' position comes from Rabbi Bachia ben Asher in his Torah commentary. He asserts, a person is not accepted as a genuine prophet before he has performed some miracle. Similarly, Rabbi Joseph Albo explains, the veracity of a prophet is proved either when he truly foretells the future in all particulars or when he performs miracles. If a prophecy is verified in this way, the Torah specifically commands us to obey the prophet. Here's the point. What the Tanakh and Jewish tradition reveals is if a person claims to be a prophet and God is the source of power of their miracle, Israel is commanded to recognize that person as a true prophet. With this in mind, now let's examine some key texts found in the New Testament. In Matthew 12, when Jesus heals a demon-possessed man who is blind and mute, the crowds ask, can this be the son of David? Meaning, can this be the Messiah? The text continues in verse 24, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. These Pharisees are not questioning whether Jesus actually performed a healing miraculous sign. Rather, they are countering the crowd's curiosity that Jesus may be the Messiah by asserting that the source of Jesus' miracles are not from God, but they're from Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Jesus then provides an argument for why his miracles come from God's power. But some of the Pharisees continue in verse 38, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. And Jewish scholar Aaron Gale points out that this is the Pharisees asking Jesus to prove that he is the Messiah, to provide a sign to prove that he is, is in fact the Messiah. Now, Jesus could have said, well, I just, I just healed someone. I just you know, healed the man who was blind and mute. I cast out a demon. Is that really not enough? Didn't I just, didn't I just show you that this came from God's power? No, he doesn't say that. This is what he says. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What he is saying here is that the sign to prove his messianic identity will be comparable to Jonah's experience in the belly of the whale. Skipping a few chapters later, in Matthew 16, when Jesus brings his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, he asks, Who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, identifying him as the Messiah. Jesus affirms Peter's answer and explains, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Matthew recounts Jesus' explanation of the sign of Jonah, saying, From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. By teaching this to his disciples, Jesus clarifies the sign of Jonah as his death and resurrection. According to Jesus, God revealed the knowledge to Peter that Jesus was the Messiah. And it's bold enough to accept the title, but to add to this, Jesus claims that this revelation came from God himself. And this is significant because according to Deuteronomy 18 verse 20, the prophet who willfully shall speak a word in my name, that which I have not commanded him to speak, that prophet shall die. If Jesus was not the Messiah, as he claimed, then according to the Torah, he was a false prophet and deserved to die. The Sanhedrin did not accept Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, and Mark 14, verse 61 through 62, recounts his trial before the Sanhedrin, and this is what it says. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. 
and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. In this response, Yeshua affirms his messianic identity and quotes from Daniel 7.13 and Psalm 110 verse 1 for further clarification. Now, Daniel 7, verse 13 through 14 reads as follows. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a man came. He came up to the one of ancient days, and they brought him before him. He was given dominion, honor, and kingship, so that peoples, nations, and languages would serve him. His dominion would be an everlasting dominion that would never pass, and his kingship would never be destroyed. In this passage, Daniel has a vision where he sees a man riding on the clouds of heaven, And this is significant because in the Tanakh, this is something only God does. According to Hebrew scholar J.A. Emerton, the act of coming with the clouds suggests a theophany of Hashem himself. If Daniel verse 13 does not refer to a divine being, then it is the only exception out of about 70 passages in the Old Testament. For example, in in Isaiah 19 verse 1, it says, Behold, Hashem is riding a swift cloud and coming to Egypt. The Egyptian false gods will tremble before him, and the heart of Egypt will melt within it. And of this man, the son of man described in Daniel 7, the text says, Peoples, nations, and languages would serve him. And this word translated as serve comes from the Aramaic root palach. And every time this word is used in Daniel, it describes a service that is done exclusively to divine beings. And the text continues, His dominion would be an everlasting dominion that would never pass away, and his kingship would never be destroyed. This man who rides on the clouds of heaven as only God does, is served in the way that only divine beings are served, and is in possession of God's everlasting kingdom This is the one Jesus claims to be. In Mark 14, verse 62, Jesus states that he will be seated at the right hand of power. And this term power is a circumlocution for God's name. Jesus claims that he will share God's glory by sitting at God's right hand, meaning on his throne. And it's important to understand this in light of Isaiah 42, verse 8, which says, I am Hashem, that is my name. I shall not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven idols. According to Jewish scholar Daniel Boyarin, Yeshua makes the identical statement that God makes to Moses in Exodus 3 verse 14. Boyarin explains, The high priest of the Jews could hardly be expected to miss this illusion. Jesus claims to be the Son of Man, and indeed God himself. A statement such as this is not merely true or false, it is truth or blasphemy. In Jesus' response to the high priest, he claims that he is the Messiah who will come with the clouds of heaven and share God's glory. Jesus equates his identity as the Messiah with the incarnate God of Israel. In Mark 14, verse 63 through 64, this records the Sanhedrin's response, and this is what it says. And the high priest tore his garments and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. The Sanhedrin reject Yeshua's claim and rule that he should be executed. In the eyes of the Sanhedrin, Yeshua is a false prophet. Now, Pincus Lapid argues that Jesus did not claim to be the Messiah, and in his survey of potential messianic claims, Lapid addresses Mark's account of Jesus' trial. While recognizing Jesus' affirmative answer, I am, Lapid views Jesus' follow-up statement, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven, as contradicting his initial answer. For Lapid, the fact that Yeshua speaks of the coming Son of Man, the Messiah, in the third person, indicates that he is not referring to himself. Lapid explains it this way, The two statements of Mark seem to be self-contradictory to Jewish ears, I am, and you will see the Son of Man. If the Son of Man as Messiah is still to come, then Jesus cannot be the Messiah. And if Jesus already is the Messiah, there is no necessity of a future Savior who is still to come. Lapid cites Jesus' responses in Matthew 26, 64, You have said so, and Luke 22, 70, You say that I am, as evasive answers that fit more in line with Jesus' follow-up statement, predicting the coming Son of Man. In light of these two texts, and the contradictory answer in Mark 14, Jesus did not claim to be the Messiah, according to Lapid. If Lapid is right that Jesus is not referring to himself as the Son of Man, but only quotes Daniel 7.13 and Psalm 110 verse 1 as a way to say that this figure is coming in the future, my question is, why did the high priest charge Jesus with blasphemy when he asked Jesus about his identity? When the late Orthodox Jewish New Testament scholar David Flusser examined the same account in Luke 22, he concluded, 
In the end, however, the conviction prevailed that he himself was the coming Son of Man. Otherwise, Jesus' answer to the high priest makes no sense. Now, I think Flusser has a better reading of the text because it explains the high priest's reaction to Yeshua's answer. Yeshua is convicted because he claims to be the Messiah, the Son of Man. And this makes sense in light of the way Jesus refers to himself when he heals the paralytic man in Mark 2, verse 5 through 12. This is what it says. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak thus? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question thus in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise up, take up your pallet, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, take up your pallet, and go home. And he rose and immediately took up the pallet and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Mark notes that the scribes consider Jesus' claim to forgive the man's sins as blasphemous because it is something only God can do. Within this context, Jesus heals the man as a way to support his claim that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Daniel Boyarin explains, The objection of the scribes calling Jesus' act of forgiveness blasphemy is predicated on their assumption that Jesus is claiming divinity through his action. Jesus identifies himself as the Son of Man in the third person, just as he does in Mark 14 and Luke 22 in his trial before the Sanhedrin. Jesus claims to be the divine Messiah. Now, according to the New Testament accounts, the Sanhedrin requests Pontius Pilate to have Jesus executed, and as a result, he is sent to be crucified. So, through the available means, the Sanhedrin fulfill their duty of executing Yeshua as a false prophet, according to Deuteronomy 13, verse 6. Going back to Maimonides, Israel must obey a prophet provided they can provide a sign or wonder from God. And the sign Yeshua provided to prove his messianic identity is his resurrection from the dead. Lapid points out that 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 through 7 is, quote, the oldest testimony of the resurrection of Jesus in a Midrash-like manner, expressing that God intervened against all appearance and in spite of all unbelief and revealed his power to save. The New Testament's message is consistent. God raised Jesus from the dead. It is a claim that must be understood within its Jewish context. We know that in Judaism, God alone has the power to raise the dead. The Jerusalem Talmud explains this principle clearly by stating, quote, Only the Holy One, praise to Him, can resurrect the dead. As it is written, the Eternal kills and gives life, brings down to the pit, and lifts up, referring to 1 Samuel 2, verse 6. Another passage from the Tanakh that is understood in Judaism to reveal God alone has the power to raise the dead is Deuteronomy 32 verse 39, which says, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. During the Middle Ages, members of the Tosafot, a school of Torah and Talmudic interpretation, produced the Torah commentary Dot Zekanim. In this text, they interpreted Deuteronomy 32 verse 39 to mean, Quote, there is no other deity beside me. I cause death and I resurrect exclusively. I alone possess this power and only I am able to resurrect the dead. Another clear expression of the Jewish belief in the resurrection of the dead is found in the Amidah, declaring, You are mighty forever, O Lord. You revive the dead. It then raises the question, Who is like you, master of mighty deeds? Who can be compared to you, O king, who causes death and restores life and causes your salvation to sprout? You are faithful to restore the dead to life. Blessed are you, O Lord, who brings life to the dead. This prayer asks if anyone can be compared to God, meaning who else can raise the dead? The answer is that there is no other. Jeremiah 10 verse 6 states, There is none like you, O Hashem. You are great, and your name is great in might. Throughout history, religious Jews have continually echoed the Amidah prayer, declaring God's exclusive power to raise the dead to life.
As Maimonides points out, if the prophet, quote, seeks to discredit the teaching of Moses, we know for certain that he is a false prophet, and whatever he did was done by secret arts and with the aid of witchcraft. This process is necessary for many miracles, but the resurrection is unique because the power behind the miracle is already known. God alone can raise the dead. Now I want to talk to you about an objection that I heard from a counter-missionary and Orthodox rabbi when I was attending Messiah Conference, which is the annual Messianic Jewish Conference held at Messiah College. Now, the counter-missionary organization, Jews for Judaism, they set up a tent at the entrance to Messiah College with the goal of talking to Messianic Jews to bring them out of Messianic Judaism to, in their, in their view, deconvert them. And the years I've been going, I make an effort to... Uh, go down to the tent and have just great conversations with these counter missionaries. And sometimes there's rabbis there. And one year when I was attending Messiah conference and having conversations with, with these counter missionaries back down at the tent, uh, I was talking with one Orthodox rabbi and we were discussing the historical evidence for Yeshua's resurrection. And what he told me was this, he, during the conversation, he just really wanted me to know this. He said that even if he knew that Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus was standing right in front of him, he would not believe that he is the Messiah. Why? Because Deuteronomy 13 shows us that even false prophets can perform miracles. So the resurrection would be a test from God to see if we would remain faithful to him rather than worshiping a false Messiah. And I think we should take what this rabbi said seriously. It's a seemingly powerful objection, but in the end, Maimonides really is valuable in showing why this objection doesn't hold up. As Maimonides points out, the miracles the false prophet performs do not come from God's power. And if this is the case, how can God raising Yeshua from the dead be God testing Israel? Listen to what Abraham ibn Ezra says concerning the test in Deuteronomy 13. He says, it is a test in that God let him be and did not kill him. Rabbi Jacob ben Asher wrote something similar. He wrote, the reason why Hashem allows such a person to perform a miracle or to correctly foretell an unlikely future event is to put your faith in him to a test, to see if you will use such people to try and foretell future events for you, thus subverting your absolute faith in him. Similarly, Dr. Jeffrey Tigay, in his JPS Torah commentary on Deuteronomy, he understands the meaning of verse 4 as God, quote, allowing the sign to come true. What all these statements from these Jewish thinkers have in common is that God allows false prophets to produce signs and wonders. But this is different. This is different than God being the source of power for those false prophets' miracles. Support for Maimonides' position can be found in Deuteronomy 18, verse 20 through 22, which asks and answers the question how one can know if someone claiming to be a prophet is in fact a false prophet. This is what it says. But the prophet who willfully shall speak a word in my name, that which I have not commanded him to speak, or who shall speak in the name of the gods of others, that prophet shall die. When you say in your heart, how can we know the word that Hashem has not spoken? If the prophet will speak in the name of Hashem, and that thing will not occur and not come about, that is the word that Hashem has not spoken. With willfulness has the prophet spoken it. You should not fear him. In Deuteronomy 18, God speaks to Moses and tells him that Israel can know that one claiming to be a prophet is a false prophet when their prophecy does not come to pass. And this leads to the following observation. God would not fulfill the prophecy of a false prophet and therefore would not validate the claim of a false prophet. God may allow false prophets to perform signs and wonders, but he would not be the source of their power. And in line with this kind of reasoning, the Babylonian Talmud records Rabbi Akiva's stance on the issue of whether God would back up the claims of a false prophet by providing a miracle. This is what he says. Heaven forbid that the Holy One, blessed be he, would stop the sun for those who violate his will. A false prophet could never perform an actual miracle. So back to the objection the rabbi presented to me in the tent at Messiah College, my response would be this. God raising Jesus from the dead is not a test from God because God is the source of power behind Jesus' resurrection. God is the one raising Jesus from the dead. If God raises Jesus from the dead, thereby validating his messianic identity, are you going to believe God? At the beginning of this video, I played a clip of my question to Rabbi Daniel Freitag during the Q&A portion of his debate with Dr. Michael Brown. Now, here's a clip which is basically a perfect summary of Rabbi Freitag's central argument against Jesus' messiahship. Then all I need 
is for there to be one place in this book, one, just once, anywhere, first person statement to me from God that says, dear Jew, I changed my mind. No longer shall you keep the commandments, for the Messiah will come, and through his death, you will no longer need to keep the commandments. Once. I know you all have your laptops here. It's not here. Anywhere. In the debate, this was Rabbi Freitag's number one objection to Jesus being the Messiah. A Messiah who frees Jews from the responsibility to follow the Torah is no Messiah at all. If this is what Jesus taught, then Rabbi Freitag is right. Jesus is not the Messiah. In fact, according to Deuteronomy 13, he's a false prophet. But let's go back to Maimonides. Maimonides showed us that if Israel wants to know the power behind the miracle of a prophet in question, they have to investigate whether they teach that an idol should be worshipped or if they seek to discredit the teaching of Moses. The power behind Yeshua's miracle is already known. There is none who raises the dead except the Holy One. Therefore, because God raised him from the dead, Israel can know that Yeshua did not command them to follow other gods or teach against the Torah. Jesus' resurrection shows us that he is the Jewish Messiah who taught Israel to remain faithfully committed to Torah observance. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah because he rose from the dead. Looking at what the New Testament teaches through this lens makes a lot of sense. For example, in Mark 12, verse 28 through 31, a scribe asked Yeshua, which commandment is the first of all? And Yeshua responds, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus by no means teaches that an idol should be worshipped or seek to discredit the teaching of Moses. He upholds the Torah, recites the Shema, affirms that God alone is to be worshipped, and in line with Rabbi Hillel, cites Leviticus 19 verse 18, affirming love to be the substance of the Torah. If Jesus was wrong about his messianic identity, if he falsely prophesied his resurrection, if he led Israel to serve other gods, if he taught against Torah, his execution was Israel's necessary and proper fulfillment of Deuteronomy 13 verse 6. Deuteronomy 13 teaches that God tests Israel by allowing the false prophet to perform signs and wonders, but he is not the source of power for their miracles. When the false prophet is executed, the test is over. Dead false prophets stay dead. If God were to raise Yeshua from the dead as a false prophet, it would undermine the test he gave Israel to reliably judge whether one is a false prophet. Within this discussion, I think it's absolutely important to address another seemingly powerful objection from Pincus Lapid to Yeshua's messiahship. And this is what Lapid argues. Lapid argues that Israel will recognize the identity of the Messiah when the 11 necessary messianic prophecies are fulfilled. And these include the conversion of all Gentiles, the pilgrimage of all nations to Jerusalem, the end of all idolatry, the revelation of God's worldwide kingdom, the end of proselytism, concord among all believers, the establishment of Jerusalem as the center of global ecumen, the threefold covenant between Israel and its neighbors, the end of torment for all animals, the reunification of Israel under God, and the messianic kingdom of peace. So according to Lapid, Jews should not recognize Jesus as the Messiah because his arrival was not accompanied by the fulfillment of these prophecies. However, Lapid does concede, I am happily prepared to wait until the Messiah comes, and if he should show himself to be Jesus of Nazareth, I cannot imagine that even a single Jew who believes in God would have the least thing against that. We trust in the salvific action of God blindly and without question. Should the coming one be Jesus, he would be precisely as welcome to us as any other whom God would designate as the Redeemer of the world. Lapid's response helps clarify the objective of this presentation. When Jesus' resurrection is read through Maimonides' exposition of Deuteronomy 13, God raising Jesus from the dead would be God identifying him as the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. And if Lapid is right, that Jewish people trust in the salvific action of God blindly and without question, we should trust God's declaration of Jesus being the Messiah by raising him from the dead. 
With this divine approval, there is excellent reason to believe that the 11 prophecies will be fulfilled when Jesus returns. So to conclude, I think Rabbi Lapid's book, The Resurrection of Jesus, A Jewish Perspective, is fascinating, insightful, and should be widely read. When an Orthodox Jewish scholar says that Yeshua rose from the dead, it is worth examining how he came to this conclusion. In the end, for Lapid, the resurrection was not a sign that Yeshua was the Messiah. But as I argued, Maimonides' exposition is the key to making the connection. If Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, and his predicted sign came to pass, meaning God resurrecting him shortly after his death, then Jesus' resurrection serves as God's validation of his messianic identity and his pronouncement that Jesus taught Israel to remain faithfully committed to Torah observance. Within this framework, messianic Jews are vindicated because of Yeshua's resurrection. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this argument. My article, The Resurrection of Jesus, Another Jewish Perspective, will be published in the upcoming summer-fall issue of Kesher, a journal of Messianic Judaism. Whether you agree or disagree with my argument, I would love to hear your feedback because truth is what is most important. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can be updated on future videos. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe to get those notifications. Everyone, please follow us on social media. The links are in the description. We look forward to hearing your thoughts in this video. Thank you for joining us.